Hello, everyone, and good afternoon slash evening, wherever on this fine planet you may find yourself today. I'm Chase Jarvis, and you're listening to an episode of the Chase Jarvis Live Show here on Creative Live. You all know this show. This is where I sit down with the world's top creators and entrepreneurs, and I do everything I can to unpack their brains with the goal of helping you live your dreams in career, in hobby, and in life. And before we get to our esteemed guest, I want to uh, welcome you to, uh, presumably you're watching on a myriad of places where we're streaming right now, whatever one you find yourself on, whether that's uh, creativelive.com slash TV or Facebook Live, YouTube Live, Instagram Live, uh, Twitter, and to show up wherever you might be. Um, I also want to invite you to interact with the show today. You help shape the show. Uh, and I see your comments. The first place I see them is if you're at creativelive.com slash TV. I see those uh, in a matter of seconds. But I do uh, see all of the comments from all those various platforms. Um, we aggregate them. And, and it's my goal to help elevate some of the top questions, most popular questions, or the ones that I see recurring um, to our esteemed guests. So look forward to hearing from you. Um, and we're just we're having some folks time. Uh, we got DC in the house, Thailand. I don't know what time it is in Thailand right now. Um, always have a South Africa. Uh, oh, good, nice. We, we anyway. In short, we, we're here. global audience today, so welcome. Uh, and we all know that you're here to hear less about me and from my yappity yap mouth here. Our guest who's chuckling in the background. I hear him over there. I can see him on my. Can't quite see him yet, but. Um, well, here we go. Mario Armstrong is the host of the Emmy-winning Never Settle show, the world's first crowd-produced crowd live stream talk uh, with live participation from an in-studio and an online audience. You've probably seen him there before, maybe on Inside Edition, Dr. Oz, Steve Harvey, Rachel Ray. Mario focuses on positivity, motivation, and specific and very tactical advice, which is one of the the things that you know we prescribe here on the Chase Jarvis Live Show to inspire you to take action in your personal, professional dreams and goals. He's an entrepreneur, he's an influencer, public speaker. I came familiar with Mario's work from my dear friend Damon John from the Shark Group um, and this new daily podcast he's got called uh, Wake Up and Level Up is an amazing way to kickstart your day. I uh, can't, uh, please, I'd rather join me in tapping on the table or punching <laughs> Uh, we got Michigan, India, Montreal, all tapping on the keys from all over the world. Mark, welcome to the show. Chase, man, it's so great to be on with you and Creative Live family. And uh, thanks, Damon, for the shout out and getting me to this point. And um, look, man, I've been following you for years, been watching all of your stuff, as many people have for over a decade. And uh, it's always been impressive. It's always been consistent. It always has mattered. And it really has, has inspired a lot of us, including people like myself. So I'm really psyched for the audience tonight, man, and really uh, humbled and honored to be here and uh, fully present and in this moment and really ready to help as many people as we can. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. And man, all right. Like I'm, you know, listening to the episodes of your new show. And I'm looking at the material that uh, this audience cares about. They care about dream jobs, about overcoming fear, you know, mental health, uh, mindset, um, goals, overcoming obstacles. And just to uh, just I, I looked up at, at the names of some of your most recent episodes. Now, dream job, how to overcome your biggest fear. Effects of mental health. The way we work is changing. Dream jobs have no, I mean, to say that our universes overlap would be a mild uh, at best. And um, I want to start off because you're clearly living your best life and retrace for us, for anyone who's new to your work, how in the hell you got to where you are right now. Yeah, and I think it's um, you know, it's a great story. We all have these great stories about our own selves and our own lives. Like every single person on the planet has a purpose and has a reason for being here. You talk about this in your book. You talk about it through the idea formula and and how to break through and get there and execute and amplify and all that great stuff. And it's like we all do have something intrinsic within us 
that we may know what we have or we may be in search of, but the truth of the matter for sure is that each one of us like has a gift. The challenge is understanding if you can uncover it, uh, if you're ignoring it, are you open and aware about it? Are you listening to your intuition? You know, where your attention goes, your, in, your you know, your intent goes. So paying attention to your, uh, to your uh, intention. Uh, and I think I'm saying all that to say that, you know, society is full of so many different people that have different paths. And my path was not linear. And for a lot of creatives, this should really ring true for you and make you feel comfortable that it will be okay. Like you will get there. So in a quick synopsis, I would say, look, I went to college for communications. I ended up dropping out, not because I wanted to, but because some local thug that was in that uh, community that was in by that campus thought that I was trying to date his girlfriend who was taking English with me. And it escalated to the point where he was trying to shoot me on a college campus. So if you can just imagine in your whole life kind of being like, you were told to do well in school, which I was a C plus student. So I was happy to just get into college as it was. And then to get into college and finally get B's and B pluses and call my mom and tell her, I am a great student. This is the track. I am gonna do communications. I am gonna be on the air. I will do radio. I will do TV. This is awesome. And within two semesters of that, having to literally pack your bags and leave overnight because of my life's safety. And so from that point, college never worked again, Chase. I never found the school, the university. I just bounced around. I was lost. And so I'm saying all this to say that even though I'm still in pursuit of my best self now and still on a journey, um, and you look back, I think the most important thing to, to do is always have your integrity throughout the entire process. Always stay open to allow the flow to help you a little bit. And it's okay to focus, but don't focus so much that you're not able to get some other energy to come in and help guide you along the way. And so for me, it was a really bumpy road and I had to rely on those things to try to find my way. So fast forward, I ended up finding myself in sales. I then found myself in technology. Once I got into tech, things really kind of took off for me. I self-taught myself how to do technology, how to teach people how to use technology. And that became a good trademark for me. And so I really honed in over the last decade of being known as a tech expert and uh, a digital lifestyle expert to help people understand how to use technology and apply it in their life. And then I just kind of used that model after using leverage to get me on television about tech expertise. Remind you, this is like the time when a lot of people were trying to figure out what an iPhone is and what does it do. And so there was a lot of need, there was a big need for me to explain and dispel a lot of the tech jargon so that everyday people could start to adopt it in creative ways and useful ways. So I did the Today Show, I did uh, Steve Harvey, I did all those shows that you talked about and so many more as a tech expert. And then I said, you know what? Everybody's got grown up kids now. They got their own help desk. They don't really need me to do the tech expertise like they did before. What's my pivot? What's natural to me? What is right for me? And what have I always been about? And that's been about helping people, being motivated and inspiring. And then throughout this process, we created our own company. It's a husband and wife team. We got five people that work for us. So we've seen a lot over the last 10 years and uh, we went bankrupt in the process. Uh, and uh, lost almost everything. Um, I still get uh, kind of uh, chumpy when I talk about it because it was to the point where I was taking coins and putting it in the coin star machine in order to get gas money to try to hustle for the next appointment. So knowing what great loss kind of feels like now, and I'm not saying that my loss is bigger than someone else's because other people could have way heavier losses, uh, but that's been kind of the path and it's been gritty. It's been a lot of hustle, but it's always been rooted in integrity, having good morals, treating people the way you want to be treated, and really being open to reassessing yourself to figure out what you can do. And so today, taking all those years of experience, all those uh, issues and challenges and life experiences, uh, now what I'm all about is helping entrepreneurs with a with a, a bit of a hint of, of focus on um, uh, um, um, millennials of color 
in entrepreneurship, um, but being open to everybody, um, but just knowing that there are some nuances there. And that's been my, my life dream and my life goal right now to create shows, podcasts, programs, events, virtual things that help people get the tangible information to move to the next level. So the Never Settle Show is our latest thing. It's up on YouTube right now. We just launched it. It's got six episodes. We shot it with a full team um, and really produced what we feel is one of our best pieces of production to help people move forward in their life. So sorry, if I, I said it was a no, long no, story short, no, but no, I was trying no, to no. pack it all in really quick. No, no, no. It's all good, man. And so uh, there's two different things that uh, were at the end of your sort of arc that I want to embark on next. Uh, one path is the path of your focus on uh, helping BIPOC entrepreneurs, um, black, indigenous, and people of color. And also, I want to talk about winning an Emmy because that stumble out of bed and into an Emmy nominated creator, never winner here. Oh, look at that. Let's bring them up close. Love it, man. <laughs> Love it. So let's, uh, I, I think the time is, uh, is upon us to discussion with you today uh, about your recognition of wanting to be in service of the black community and the people. And I know you've put a lot of time and energy in part in, into the show, but also in, in a lot of your other activities. Um, tell us about how you think of that and um, and the role that it's playing for you right now. Um, great question, um, which happens often on this on your series. Uh, that's a heavy question for me, and the reason why there's such a big pause is because I feel, uh, man, we are in such a delicate time right now, and. You know, it, it is really showing, the, it's really uncovering the best humans that are out there. And it's also uncovering the worst humans or those that need help if they want to have help. Um, and right now, you know, uh, there's been so much attention when the thing with George Floyd happened and his death and, 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 and murder and so many other things. And right now I see a, a lot of people still wanting to just get back to some sense of normalcy. And I get that as a human condition or as a human need to get to some kind of routine, but there's still so much pain and suffering that is yet to still be reckoned with and dealt with. And it, there's this delicate balance. I just had someone hit me up on Instagram in the DM and, and she was just like, you know, I'm really struggling with um, my black life and uh, pursuing my dreams because it, our experience right now, we're still seeing a ton of stuff that's not hitting the news ad, ad nauseum. We're mm -hmm. still seeing, um, I mean, just today, North Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina, there were three police officers that are recorded on tape and they just got investigated by the FBI. After everything that's going on, they're recorded on tape saying, we are going to figure out how we can go kill some N-I-G-G-E-R-S. And, and so this mindset and this hate and this, this, this feeling of this weight is very serious. So as it relates to people of color, my goal has been, number one, how can I be an educator? How can I be a tool for, uh, for empowerment? How can I be a beacon of hope? And how can I deal with the hard issues that may be uncomfortable for a lot of people to deal with and try to bring more education, more awareness, and more exposure to healthy conversations so that we can get to a better level of equity? And it's not that you know people of color don't work hard. People of color work hard just like everybody else works hard. It's, it's, it's just harder when your skin color is a reason why certain things happen or don't happen to you. And so getting, getting to a point where, uh, I mean, we just met with the team and had a very open discussion about the importance of this balance. And what, what am I gonna talk about? Because I'm not just all of a sudden an activist. Obviously, I'm, I'm black and I'm, I'm actually mixed. I have a lot of other things inside of me that's not just, just black. Um, so I think from a people of color perspective, I'm looking for really elevating equity, mm -hmm. helping with creativity, uh, inspiration to get your ideas in the, into the marketplace, 
sharing with you lessons that have worked for me and failures that I've gone through to help you avoid, as well as other people that I have access to. Uh, and then, you know, being on shows like yours, man, which is doing incredible work in terms of, no, it really is. This is a big pause moment. And I know this isn't the first time this is being said, but maybe, you know, just like a marketing message, sometimes you need to hear it several times until it actually clicks. You know, it, you're, you're, a person's purpose to me must be larger than the fear of embarrassment. And I don't care if their purpose is uh, building a business and you're afraid of being embarrassed because it might fail, or if your purpose is to educate people about racism and inequality and you're afraid of being embarrassed or maybe cut off by certain people. Your purpose must be larger than your fear or your embarrassment. And what I see in, in you and others like you that have really um, shown that it just, it, it really hits us in a way that you can't really understand, Chase. Mm -hmm. um, it oh. just, you know, cause it's a different lived experience, brother. And um, so uh, I'm an emotional type of dude, man. I put it all out there. I get very transparent and open and I'm, I'm getting a little choked up because, you know, the, the, the purpose and humanity needs clarity and you're providing another path among other paths that are out there to create that opportunity. And when we can have roads that create the opportunity for clarity, and then you get to have that clarity from different voices, it really begins to open up the opportunities of how one is seen mm -hmm. and what the possibilities and capabilities are. So someone now may see another Mario in the street and look at that person completely differently because they talk, they they found out about a guy with an Emmy award that's got this graffiti jacket on. It's on Chase's show. You know what I mean, man? Uh, I, I'm I'm so grateful for the kind words. I I, I want to put it back on you because you you know I believe that you you can't be what you can't see. And hard, you know. I had uh, I, I I was raised in such a way that. You know, just like it was established that you would just do this thing and then do the next thing and the next thing. And, and that didn't come from a bad place from my parents. But I certainly um, wanted to investigate ways to be different, ways to be better than what was expected of me. And I, I think that there, you know, I think that was the, the bar was quite high based on being white male the lower middle class but in the you know 70 like advantage and still found breaking free and becoming the person i wanted to be the hardest thing ever done and that from privilege how hard it is and then to um connect with you and other people that you know we share in common that have been on the show you are really doing it you are again when you just i got emotional when you're holding that emmy up there and it made me remember like it's very hard to be what you can't see and i had a lot looked like me that were doing the things that i wanted to do and i think that i just want to say thank you and for the courage of going out there and and claiming those Emmys and being willing to go on not just my show but the Today Show and Steve Harvey and yeah all the other NBC and CNN and has three letters and I'm wondering you know was that always a goal or has this cre has momentum built for you as you tasted the first whether this was a a, a bit of success or uh, mm -hmm. the the, the tingle of fulfillment like you know was this a, a goal from an early age and or, yeah. or has it evolved has it evolved to be a role model you know um it's evolved uh there were certain aspects of this that was a goal but it reminds me in the, the the very first part of your book where you start talking about the whisper of your intention and being able to um, intuition being able to listen to that whisper of the intuition and the fact that that whisper of the intuition that gut 
that thing that's telling you what you should go do, even if it's against everything that everyone else thinks you should be doing or you could be doing, but your gut's telling you to go do a thing. It's so unknown. That uncertainty is what really holds so many people back. And it's just, when I hear that question, the first thing that comes to mind was, there were moments where I knew my path. Like I knew what I wanted to pursue. I didn't know how I was going to pursue it. So really quick example. Um, several years ago, how it all got started was I was actually uh, reading a newspaper. So this goes back like 15 or so years, uh, reading a newspaper. And uh, I was with my wife and we were sitting on a, a, a beach and there was an ad in this newspaper. It was from Baltimore, my hometown. And the ad said, host your own radio show. And I was like, honey, when we get back, I'm gonna call this station and I'm hosting my own radio show. Like I had been working in tech companies and tech jobs and I had been a great tech educator and I had really built up this, this background of tech expertise. Um, but I was ready to now to take it to the airwaves and teach people through communications, the thing that I went back when I went to school for, right? Now I'm finally getting a chance to see an opportunity. I go to the radio station, it's in Annapolis, really small little town in Maryland. The, the, the satellite is only gonna throw the, the signal probably a good 10 miles. It's not going far at all. It's an AM station, WBIS AM 1190 were the call letters. And it was like in this little house. And I knocked on the door, went in, and they were like, sure, we'd love to have a show that would teach people about tech. You could have a half hour every Thursday, 12.30 p.m. Uh, in the afternoon. And I was like, great. And they were like, oh, and it's just going to cost you a 1000 bucks a week. I think it was 800 800 bucks a week. So I was like, oh, man. So now my sales experience comes into play because I want to be on the air to talk about tech and help educate people because that was a big need, but I needed to get 800 bucks a week to do it and I don't have that. So that's when I used my sales experience to go find a sponsor. And I, so I got to put together the brochure. I got to put together the kit. I got to show them the satellite map and the reach and all this stuff. And you're out there pitching and you're hustling. I finally get a sponsor, got a few months under my belt. And then the last little twist of the story is I'm still working full time. I'm at a tech company at the help desk, senior person, on, one of the senior people on help desk working. And the radio station was literally about 20 minutes away or 15 minutes or so away from my job. So I would have to sneak out of the office every, every Thursday early for lunch, eat my lunch in the car, get to the radio station with about five minutes to go live on the air, do a little half hour show that I self-produced and then hop back into the car and try to creep into the office without being caught. And it never dawned on me that they might actually know where I was if they just turned on the radio. Like it never hit me <laughs> that that might happen one day. And so that's, that is the beginning people. It was sloppy. It was, it was hungry. It was fun. It was, uh, unknown, it was uncertain, but I knew when I was doing that thing that that was it. Now I needed to get bigger. How do I get to FM? How do I get to a bigger station? How do I get syndicated? How do I then parlay that into TV? And so I would rinse and repeat a lot of what I call working from uh, fee uh, from free to fee, where you basically are uh, enabling yourself to walk into opportunities where you offer some value or something for free in, in exchange to getting whatever you need. I needed to get on TV. So I said, hey, I'm doing this radio show. What if I package the segment? And I did that for free for you every Thursday. And we called it Tech Tip Thursdays. And they were like, yeah, you'll come in for free and do a two minute segment. I was like, yeah. But in, in, inside, it's like, yeah, because I want to learn how to do this TV thing in a live arena. And so that process validated those small steps, kept giving me validation that, yes, this is something I like. This is something I love. Now I have to figure out how do I really monetize it? How do I really make a business out of this? How do I really get really ex expert at this? And what do I need to do in terms of knowledge, in terms of resources and access to really help it grow? Mm. I love these gritty early stories. So, <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of you when you were just like, "Yeah, I'm not going to do that doctor thing, right?" <laughs> yeah, man. And I'm telling you, I'm 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 like, uh, I remember when I decided that I want to do this photography thing, like doing sneaking in, doing anything it took to be even close to the action, not actually even technically in the. Action. There were the actual photographers, and then there was me, the poser, just like, right. you know, glomming on to the, to the, you know, sticking my camera through the fence, you know, and, and your story reminds me of so many others who've been on the show that the early 
world is gritty and as you said, nonlinear. And I think that that is something that keeps so many people from going to the second step. They'll dip their toe in it and then they realize that they're not on the inside right away. And that you, you know, leaving lunch, showing up there, thank God it was radio because you had some sandwich in your teeth. And you know, giving you a shout out, Dr. Vibe. Um, Mario's been one of the major positive influences in my life over the past five years. Uh, here's giving you a shout out, Edward. Good people. People from all over the world are recognizing that, wait a minute, what I just learned from Mario is. Um, that sounds more like what my life looks like. I'm wondering to keep this, um, the momentum here, other things in your life were felt different <laughs> or, or were different on the inside than what it looked like on the outside to others. Hmm. Man, that's a, that's a really great question. I think, um, I think a lot of times, you know, you, you know, you know what this really makes me go to. It really makes me go right to uh, Dr. Festinger's uh, social comparison theory, and and social comparison theory is this is this human thing that we all do. We compare socially, whether you know you're doing it or not. It's 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 kind of innate to who you are. The difference is whether you're doing upward comparisons or you're doing downward comparisons. An upward comparison is one that can be inspirational. Someone you look to that gives you inspiration, that motivates you, maybe has exposed you to something that you're interested in doing and is showing you models of how you can get it done and potential that you can do. Downward comparison is when someone has to be beneath you in order for you to feel above them. And so it's also right off the bat a negative energy, but it also means you have to belittle someone, whether mentally, physically, spiritually, whatever, uh, uh, systematically, in order for you to feel more superior. And so I'm saying all that to say that I think a lot of times people compare it to your question. I think people think Mario's made it. Mario's, Mario's doing just fine. Mario's uh, uh, good to go. Like, I think this, the appearance of um, comfort and easeability, I think, can really confuse people on their own potential to pursue their dreams. Because if you start to naturally just look at someone but not know their backstory or the process of what it took them to get there, it's easy to make perceptions and assumptions about where you think they are. And so I think one of the things that you know people may, may not know um, is that we're still we're still struggling like we're still in the hustle of the struggle like we're we're literally we literally had a meeting today and we said you know we've been making great impact for people and this year what we're going to do is we're going to focus more on profitability that was a hard thing to kind of really digest that you you because a lot of times you can kind of take your eye you think you're taking your eyes off the ball or that these things are, are are mutually exclusive that you can't you know have great impact and be a good person and also want to be able to be profitable right but when I went to Richard Branson's island got invited to his island and I and I heard him say profits people planet he makes the money invests in good people hires them and gets the right people to execute but then also be a good planet citizen. What can you do, whether that's fighting racism and inequality or LGBTQ, or whether that means taking care of the earth in, the, in, the, in, a, in a more you know, uh, uh, real way. Um, without the profits, that's, so I think that's a thing that maybe a lot of people, look, we've had successes. Um, there's no doubt about that. And we've, we have been able to make some money and have a great quality of life. So I'm definitely not dissing the blessings. But I think there is a, a level that we haven't attained yet or reached yet and, um, and a certain amount of people that we have not hit yet. You know, and, and the universe can't help you if you're standing still. So to your earlier point, it's, you know, if you feel like you can't get to that next step, hopefully you're hearing that we're still in those steps. I'm still in those steps. OK, yeah. you know, and I bet Chase is like in those steps and I'm looking at Chase like I I'm socially comparing. Check this out. Right. 
shit, man, Chase is already, are you kidding me? Chase has been doing Creative Live for X amount of years. He's got an educational platform that's reaching millions of people. I would love to be able to hit just a percentage of that, right? But a few years ago, you were saying some similar stuff too, right? And look where you are. And you still are looking at other people and you're like, yo, I'm not even where I know I can be yet. So I, I think it's, it really is confusing to people uh, what, they, what they see but what they may not know. So uh, through your show and others, it's really revealing to a lot of people what, what the work really involves and what the process really looks like. Well, to me, what is often not understood, and you just absolutely laid it home, was like everyone thinks and feels it's not necessarily about not being enough because I think there's a lot of the folks that have, that um, I think in order to show up in the, in the way that you do, um, you have to have a certain amount of respect for yourself, but that, that this so idea true. that there's work to be done and it is very, uh, it's hopefully reassuring to anyone who's listening right now. And I will echo your sentiments, Mario, that, you know, I don't, I don't, um, I, I try and find a way to live in the present but I also, I have to um, have some ongoing motivation. The, as you said earlier, the reason, what's your why, what's your clarity, which is what I want to get to in just a second here. And just, I don't know anyone that's been on the show that doesn't have that. And to me, this is an important topic for us to talk about because it's, I believe that when you look at, when all of us look at others, there's this understanding or belief, rather a false belief that, that they've got to figure it figured out. We're all just on, right? And we're all trying to figure it out. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, you talked about simultaneously, you know, being grateful for the blessings, but wanting to move forward. I, 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 I couldn't, underscore that enough. I feel like that is a really important piece of the puzzle that most, you know, remember the way I like to think about it is remember when you wanted what you Because the chances Beautiful. are it probably wasn't all that long ago. Yep. Beautiful. But you, you've said, you said one word about five times so far, and it's a question that, that has come in from Dr. Dr. Vibe uh, here at the creativelive.com slash TV link. And Dr. Vibe says, one of the things that Mario has taught me the most is the importance of clarity. And having heard you say that like five or six times and be crisp, you know, you're, you're crisp in your articulation of where you've been and what you want to do. How, you know, is this very, is this something you're very cognizant of or is this just embedded at a fundamental level in how you think and operate um, that, that you don't even recognize it? Is it very intentional? And if so, talk to me about clarity. Great follow up and add on to that question. Uh, no, it, it is very intentional. It is not natural. I was not the 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 poster child for clarity. In fact, um, I, I look more like the poster child of just like you know split personality, multiple projects probably not too focused. Oh, he's got too many things going on at the same time. Oh, he's media, you know, he's great at being mediocre at a lot of things as opposed to being great at one thing. Um, so I don't think that I was that, that, that I, I wasn't that person at all. And so it's been very intentional and man, to, to even hear you say like, it's challenging for you to try to stay present. It's challenging for so many people, even those of us who practice the rituals daily, like I'm practicing daily, both, you know, I'm, I'm strong in my, my Christian uh, faith and, and belief in, in God, but I'm also very strong in my Buddhist principles and Buddhist spirituality. And so, um, you know, that development of clarity took time. Look, man, if this can help somebody, that my wife and I, who is the CEO of this company, and we've been happily married, you know, people ask me, what's my definition of success? And I'm like, it's harmony. Like being, just having harmony around me. Like being the best father that I can be to my son, being the best husband to my wife, uh, being the best entrepreneur that I can be, and, and, and being the best uh, uh, teacher that I can possibly be, an educator. And, 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 and balancing those things in harmony. And when I think about clarity and vision, we just sat down and just said, you know what we're gonna do this summer? we are going to sit even more still 
and open ourselves up to allow more things to happen. Here's the craziness. You think like, wait, how can you sit still and allow more things to happen? If you aren't moving, how can things get to be moving? How can people? And so that's where this push and pull comes from that confuses so many people. Here's what we're doing. In this quarantine, COVID kind of environment, lots of unknown, lots of uncertainty, we decided we were going to focus on one particular thing, and then we were for 80%, and then we were going to split the 20% across one other additional project that we will quietly and lightly work on, and uh, one other little thing that we are just going to explore to see where that kind of takes us. And so what we mean by sitting still is we, we have cut the hours that we're working. We're taking Fridays completely off. We are allowing ourselves to be more open in, in the actual now so that we can better ourselves and actually open ourselves up to other possibilities. Because what happens when you open your energy up you allow other things that you may not notice or recognize to come in. How many of you get into a shower and you get a ton of ideas? How many of you hit the bike and you get a ton of ideas? So you already know like where you can create those ideas. and where If you can sit still in that kind of moment, you can start to understand that you intrinsically have the power to create an energy around you where you'll still be fed, you'll still eat, you'll still hustle, but you'll do it in a much more mindful way. We call it the mindful hustle. How can we hustle mindfully? And so this is one part experiment to see how this really flows for us, but it's also something that's deep rooted in, in our practice of clarity and mindfulness to get to this point. And it's very, uh, you know, it's not something that's kind of, it goes against what you would normally think an entrepreneur should be doing or uh, could be doing. And so um, that's that's why that word comes up so much, because in this time, this is the mo people. This is the moment for you to reassess. I, I you know, I, I people have read Chase's book and it's and it's given them ideas on how they could create a new a, a new business or to finally make that leap. Uh, or they've seen a video of yours or they've gone to a creative live class like people know like you right now are in a space where if you really understand that nothing's really happening, you have no real control over this uncertainty. And since it's so uncertain, this is the best time for you to do rapid acquisition of skills, rapid acquisition of self-assessment, rapid acquisition of where do I really want to be? What do I really want to do with my family? Who are the stakeholders? How do I get my family to really believe in my idea or what it is I want to do? Like this is that time. Time. You really won't ever have this kind of time back again. And so I'm hoping that, you know, we are listening to our own advice and will prosper when things get back to whatever the new normal is, um, because we have taken the time to sit still during the best opportune time to reassess yourself. Mm. Mm -hmm. Love it. All right. You have uh, as I articulated earlier, I will restate now. You have uh, in your series "Net Will Settle." You have uh, an episode named "Dreams Have No Expiration Date." <laughs> what, what do you mean by that? That there are a lot of people that right now could be watching this, and they're saying, "You know what? I'm not 20 anymore." <laughs> I, I got obligations. I got bills to pay. I got kids that need to go to school, tuitions hitting me hard, whatever those challenges may be. And all I'm, my point with this is that a lot of times we forget that, you know, the biggest secret that successful people don't want anyone to know, you alluded to this earlier, but the biggest secret that successful people don't want anyone to know is that we're all figuring this out as we go along. Like nobody has the answers. You, you just, you figure it out as you go along. And so in that same lane, dreams have no expiration date because you're still figuring it out as you go along. So the minute you put an expiration date or the minute you have decided, I'm no longer going to pursue that idea or that dream, you have effectively told the energy and the universe and everything about your existence that that is no longer important to me. I mean, you can't even get the reticular activating system, which is a part of our brain, to, to even focus in on opportunities. For those, I'll give you a quick shorthand. For those that don't know what that is, that's, that's when you say, uh, I'm thinking about getting that new Toyota Corolla, that red Toyota Corolla. And all of a sudden, 
all you see everywhere you go now is the red Toyota Corolla. That's because you've told your brain you have a very big interest in that, and that's a priority. So now your brain is filtering all the noise that's in the world, and it zones in on that red Toyota Corolla. Now you see it everywhere. You never saw it all before. Now you see it everywhere. So you, what you tell yourself, you are actually saying, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to accomplish. This is who I want to be, or this is what, who I am. And that is projecting energy outward. The minute you say the inverse, here's who I don't want to be, here's who I don't want to accomplish, here's what, I, what I'm going to give up on, you're telling the universe that same story as well. So I just think that dreams have no expiration date reminds people that it's, it's never too late to do the thing that you feel that you should be doing. Goes back to your point of you know, the creative calling. The callings can change. And it's okay. They can develop and it's okay. But here's what's, you know, when something's important enough to do it, you got to do it even if the odds are against you. Like, you, you know, and I think that a lot of times, you know, direction can appear out of disruption. You allow uh, the disruption to be used in a way you talk about using fear in your book. You talk about using fear. I, I, I say use fear to focus. You don't run from the fear. Actually, when fear happens, your pupils dilate, everything gets serious, your mouth gets watering, you get tensed up, your body's actually zoning in. So it's your chance to actually now grow to a new level because you're zoning in. So I just think that dreams don't have an expiration date, and that's because failure is never final. The only thing that fail, the only definition of failure in my book, Chase, man, is if you don't try. Like otherwise, for all of you that maybe tried something and you feel like it, it, was, it didn't work, you know what, man? You know how many try, times I tried a TV show and it didn't work, and then I had to re-pivot, and then I had to re... I mean, I just... Let me be straight up honest, man, real quick. I was like, yo, I am tired of pitching this show to get distribution. Like, I'm, like we've worked so hard to create such a polished product. Like, are we really still having to do this right now? Like, you know what I mean? Like, you would think at a certain point, like, you get the phone that would call, you got a couple Emmys, the, the emails are going to come in. Like, it's going to happen. And all I'm saying is you have to constantly be committed to yourself, people. Be true to yourself. Don't let yourself down. And don't worry about uh, the haters. Worry about the people that actually believe in you. We spend more time focused on proving our haters wrong instead of proving our supporters right. You got people that are rooting for you and, and, and you don't want to believe in yourself. And so, man, dreams have no expiration date. Failure's not final. And I just really wholeheartedly believe that, you know, look, man, look at Stan Lee's example, right? Like people think Stan Lee made it. Stan Lee didn't make it until he was like fit. Like he didn't even start making it until he was like fifty. <laughs> the woman that the woman that created uh, a Build a Bear. Like everybody, you know, if you know the little Build a Bear shops everywhere. The woman that created Build a Bear started that idea when she was forty nine. Like forty nine, she was working in retail up until that point. So yeah, that's it's a it's a reminder and it's a call to action to not give up on yourself and that placing, ex, uh, expiring your dreams is doing a disservice to all of us because now we're not getting your potential and we're not getting your gift. Mm. You said this earlier, I want more depth on it. You said uh, from free to fee. Oh, yeah. What does that mean? That means standing outside of your ego and removing pride and ego to the side, recognizing what you want to accomplish for yourself. Notice, in order to do that, Chase, I gotta, you got to have clarity, right? Like, what do I want to accomplish for myself? You're well, good. i got to have clarity. Hold on, on here. Yep. <laughs> you know, so, so once you have that, then it's easy for you to see uh, how I can offer a some value from me to someone else for free because of what I know I will get in exchange. So your job is if you are trying to break into a new area, if you're trying to pivot, if you're trying to take your side hustle to main hustle, if you're trying to go from photography hobbyist with a few clients to really blowing this thing out, you need to understand what are the next steps? What do I need to acquire as skill, as knowledge, 
as opportunity, as networks, resources, people? And where does that stuff exist? Okay, now that I've identified that, what can I offer those things that I'm prioritizing for value for free? Even though I charge 3,500, even though I charge 15 grand, even though I get 35,000, like do it for free because you know specifically what you are going to achieve from it. And the only way that works is when you're upfront about why you're offering something for free and what you need in exchange. And if you don't feel comfortable having it verbally, put a MOU together, get that memorandum of understanding, put it on paper. But that's that's been a model for what I've done Anytime I felt like I needed something that I didn't have access to, I would try to figure out how can I bring value to that thing that I need for free, legit value to that thing in hopes of getting what I needed from it. And so this is the same thing where people say, well, you know, um, I don't want to do any more public speaking for free or whatever. It's like, okay, but that's fine. Is, is, but do you, do you need, are you, if you're saying I want to become a great life coach or if I want to become a great motivator or if I want to become a, 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 an on air type of communicator, um, public speaking is important. So the clarity would then say, you know, yes, I would like to get paid, but on that particular one, that audience is more important to me than getting paid. Getting seen by that audience and to deliver a message to that audience is more important than me making the money from that audience. And so that's to me how you can take this from fee, from free to fee. The fee will come. It, it, and not to be uh, like just build it and it'll happen. You have to think with your profitability in mind. The clarity, but, part, right? That's, the <laughs> that's right. But that's what fee, you know, from going from free to fee means. It's the ability to step outside of the ego. Uh, and really saying, I need something and I'm willing to give some value for something. I find that there are so many adults that have conditioned themselves over time that they close that door because they feel that either people are taking advantage of them, and in some cases they are, and that's legit, but in a lot of cases, it's just because you feel that you are owed a certain level of expectation and something that you would like to, to get from that. And that's not saying that that's not justifiable. It's just saying if you have a picture of where you want to go and that particular opportunity is coming to you and it's not coming to you with the way that you would like it to come to you, hopefully you're thinking bigger than that short term thing that's in front of your face. Mm -hmm. And so I think that from from free to fee is more of a, a, a mindset and a theory of how can I acquire the things that I need by offering value to someone else for free and removing my ego from it? Amazing, thank you. I remember, um, I think it was on your Instagram feed. Um, I remember seeing something about most people quit just before the and I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, man. It's like, uh, you, you, I say this. I say, you know you hit the roughest part when it's the easiest time to quit. And if you can just like, you know you hit the roughest part when it's the easiest time to quit. So if you're in the roughest part, this is the moment when it's the easiest time to quit. So more than likely, this is the roughest part. You, you can go up from here. It, it probably can't bottom out too much more than where it is. And so I think, you know, ambitious people need boundaries. When you have a dream or when you have a desire or when you have a, a, a focus on something that you want to achieve and, and you're being ambitious about it, I believe to a certain extent ambitious people need boundaries in order to, number one, take care of themselves mentally and build up resilience uh, for the journey. Uh, but also uh, they need to pr uh, put boundaries around them because their ambition can blind them. You can be so ambitious that you can make hasty decisions. You can be so ambitious that you could do somebody wrong. You could try to take a shortcut. You could try to uh, cheat your way through something or, or, you know, not be fully committed to something. It's ambitious people need some boundaries. And so I just think that when you hit these rough parts, these guardrails are there to keep you focused and to keep you in line. And when you hit the roughest part, just know that your roughest part 
is probably someone else's blessing to be where you are. Like, it's hard to think of that. And this is why I really want people to do one of the things that I try to share with people is something. So it's a family practice that we've done for years. And it's called the three wins. And the three wins is every single Sunday, we go around the table or we pick up the phone and call relatives. They're, we're known to just pick up the phone and be like, okay, it's three wins time. What are your three wins? And we'll call our aunts and cousins and other people and put them on speakerphone or on Zoom. We've done that too. And the three wins is a moment for you to reflect on your past week and to really identify three things that went well for you that week. Because when you're in the roughest part and it is easy to quit, there was still something that went well that week. Yeah. But you've overlooked it so easily because the pain of this roughest part has blinded you from seeing the things that actually have been a blessing. So it could have been a great meal that you had. It could have been a phone call with a friend. It doesn't have to be some, we won an Emmy. You know, it doesn't have to be some, in, you know, some huge accomplishment in order for it to be deemed a win. It just needs to be a win because what I find, Chase, is that most people can come up with maybe one or two and then they're looking in their phone to try to figure out what they did that week that was great. Or they're, they're trying to, because we are wired to know what we haven't accomplished, not wired to have gratitude for what we have accomplished. So if you're dealing with that roughest part, I would say start with that three wins practice to try to help remind you that you are still winning and that you still have potential and that uh, other people are doing worse than you are. So- uh, keep going. Yeah, it's it's also true that when it gets hard, and there are a lot of things in, in business, like getting from like, you know, the $10 million mark to something more than that. Uh, in Major League Baseball, getting to double A is super hard, or whatever the, whatever yep. <laughs> sports right. or business or life analogy you want to use. And you know what, that's when most people quit. So if you can push through that part that is so hard for you. Inside of that threshold, I mean, I've consistently found this with photography. It's like, you know, you had a you had a sale or you made some money or did a big campaign and that's where people are high five and that's it. when it goes dark because you're like, oh, you were just like used by that big high profile thing and they don't people don't want to touch you for a while or and what I find is that that well it's basically a, a Resaying what you said is like this just the keep going part is such a crucial part of being an entrepreneur it's a it's a crucial part of believing in yourself and i i don't know you don't if you're quitting when it gets hard <laughs> right you don't, no man that's not how the game works. No. And you have to set your sights. You know, all of this doesn't mean that you don't set your sights on, on a, on a prize or on uh, a direction and on a path and on a very specific goal. You know, you can get into affirmations. All I'm saying is one of the things that I would like people to start doing is removing some of the attachment to exactly how that needs to unfold. So have your goal, have your dream, have the thing that you see. Like I often say, like dream far, but focus near. All that means is knowing what the vision is out there and afar, but also reverse engineering. What are the small, very small steps that I need to start making in order to get towards that very big dream? Because just looking at that big dream is incredibly overwhelming to me right now. And now I got a bunch of angst and I feel anxiety and all these other things and stress and my cortisol levels go up and all this stuff. And so breaking those things down to really, really small pieces, I think, um, you know, is critical. And having a goal like the Emmys was, was a goal, but I was open to how we would get there. I wasn't so concerned on not being able to allow certain energy to come in and help me find the flow uh, to get there. But I can tell you this, when I walked into our first production meeting, um, and I mean, we're on a shoestring budget and there's like 10 of us in this, in this production room. And I go in there with this, like 30 pages in a packet and I put it down on the conference table. And I say, this right here is the packet for the Emmy awards. And I just read through twice, every single thing about this whole thing, what's involved. And I said, and we're going to, we're going to go for an Emmy. We didn't even have the show concept down, bruh. <laughs> like. <laughs> the show concept wasn't even fully baked yet. Like we, all we know is that we got the green light because, oh, get this, Chase, man, to do my first show, to do the first season, we couldn't afford a studio. 
So once we realized that, oh, a New York studio is going to cost me $286,000 to be able to have for like a week, and I could try to do a bunch of recordings, you know, each day by going to Chelsea Studios. I was like, we can't, we don't have that money. Like, what? We, we barely got $30,000 right now. Like, what are you talking about? So then I started thinking, all right, what about using a company's lobby that has enough space where we could, that maybe they do events and that where we'll bring in the set, whatever that is, and we'll do our interview session and everything like in their lobby. So then I called, I, I called, uh, uh, Vayner Media, and I went over there and checked their place out, and it didn't work out for the size they had. And then I ended up calling this other company called Canary, and they had a beautiful space. So they let me use their lobby of their offices where we could fit 40 people in seats in folding chairs. Our director and my producer was in a damn broom closet. That was like the control room. It was a We built the set, put it up, and then broke it down as if we weren't even there. And then we gave them a shout out in the show in exchange for being able to use the space. Like that's that's what it takes, man. That's you know that's how you get to like. They don't happen because you. I had the money. They don't happen because I had the. Look, I was being told no when I was on the Today Show. I'm pitching my show idea to NBC executives that pay me to be on air on NBC. So they love me and they're still saying no to the idea. <laughs> so you have to have an enormous amount of belief in yourself. You have to surround yourself with people that believe in you and you have to seek out people like Chase, myself, Chase's guests and the content that he's producing in order to fill you with that Sust substance and that sustenance because we don't cultivate re resiliency in, in this society. What we cultivate is really from a young age teaching people to win. Like, I don't know about you, man, but I played sports as a kid and it was all about winning. And, and I've learned the best from all my losses. I didn't learn jack from anything I won. I learned everything from what I did wrong. And so when we can now get to a mindset where we don't see failure as a bad thing, that it's actually a learning mechanism and it's actually, we're supposed to take risk because that's the only way we can learn. And by doing so, we build up resiliency so we can take the next hit and the next hit and the next hit. It's just like doing push-ups. But the only way to build resiliency is to go out there and try something, get knocked down and get back up. So yeah, man, I think, you know, we've had that dream and uh, we went for it, <laughs> but we weren't attached. I was not attached to getting the Emmy more than I was attached to doing a good show that was going to help people. You talk about mindfulness a lot. I have a, a wife who's a mindfulness teacher. and Oh, uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Kate teaches mindfulness. And uh, I like this idea, this sort of yin-yang. You got this, like, the mindful hustle. Mm. And I think people understand the hustle part because it was – long glorified and you know and right. yeah i think the mindfulness part is uh misunderstood and stillness i'm wondering if the stillness stuff that you talked about earlier is that is that the full picture of mindfulness or if you could just maybe share a little bit of your your thoughts on on mindfulness because I, it's a missing piece of the conversation for sure yeah, it's a tough place to get to, and I'm certainly no expert at getting there, but I've worked uh, a lot on building intrinsic awareness and trying to get to that understanding. In a short definition to me, and different people will have different definitions for this, but for me, it's getting to a place of neutral. It's a, it's a natural state. So mindfulness to me means I'm, ni I'm neither... Uh, I'm neither desiring a goal, like I have, I have a goal, but I neither desire that goal or uh, am attached to that goal. Like, like I, I sit in a place of neutrality, in a place of a natural state of saying, I would love to be able to go and try to do this thing or create this impact. But at the same time, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, I'm not attached to it. That's a very weird thing to tell an entrepreneur or a creator because we've been conditioned to say, well, wait, I thought you said you were going for that thing. 
So then that means you got to do every single thing to focus on that thing. And there is a level of focus that is being done. Being mindfulness, being mindful doesn't mean I'm not being focused. It actually means the opposite. I'm being very focused. But what it also is saying is I'm also not so attached to that desire or to that specific outcome because I'm trusting that even if I pursue a particular thing and it's with good intent, that it is going to reveal to me along that journey what it is I'm really supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? your dream may not be big enough. It may not be big. Chase Jarvis did not know that he was gonna be having a multi-million dollar education online company when he was running around trying to figure himself out, running around with a camera. Like he ain't know, he just wanted to be a photographer. Come on, man. <laughs> like this is what, but when you have the intent of then realizing, oh, I'm teaching people. Oh, people are listening. Oh, I have value. Oh, I have these experiences. Oh, I've had these failures. I can share this. Oh, that's bringing more people that want to learn. Oh, well, maybe I should start teaching. Oh, well, maybe I shouldn't just be teaching. Maybe other people should teach too. And like, it's you were in a natural, whether you know this or not, you were in a natural state and you were in a more neutral state of, yeah, you had ambition and yeah, you had drive. And yeah, you had to focus on what you would like to achieve and you would acquire skills and experience and hustle for it, but you were also had no clue that your journey would map out the way it has. And so sometimes we aren't even dreaming big enough for ourselves. And so for me, the mindfulness is about reducing stress, reducing angst in your life, being a good human being at the core, like working on being a good human. That means doing simple stuff like holding the door for people, saying, excuse me, saying hi, giving a wave, like it, it, at the core working on this. And then, and then being in the moment of now. Sure, you can think about the future and what you would like to try to achieve. Sure, the past has already happened and it's gone. It took place already. Where we are right now is in this moment. And so if you can bring your full self to that present moment, you'll create more opportunities for you. It's like the person that sits there and they're in a conversation and they're actually waiting to actually say something. They're really not listening to you because they're so anxious to want to say something. They're missing the whole opportunity. Someone could have just said something great to them that could have just changed their life or maybe it's an opportunity they could take off with, but because they were so focused on what they wanted to say and they were in the future, I call it future thought, they were in future thought, they missed what was actually happening right there in the present. And so when you can get to that space of being more in the present, I think uh, it enables you to prove your potential better. And I think it enables you to design a life that prioritizes your passions better. Mm. Sounds, it's very Buddhist, right? being in the now, not being attached. Um, and it's I'll, scary, man. Dude, I, I'm like, yo, sometimes I'm like, sometimes I question that shit. I'm like, yo, should I really be this like, should I really be sitting still right now? <laughs> yeah, but that's, there's two things that I want to comment on that, which I think is, um, I'll just say, that. you know, one, you, you mentioned sports earlier, and I'm a huge fan of Russell Wilson. He's the quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks, which are my team. Mm -hmm. I think he's also a stellar human being. He talks a lot about this neutral thinking. And what I, I have heard and I would like to hear from you is, is so much judgment out there. Judgment of Ooh. self, you know, uh, relative to the expectations that we had versus if you can have a preference for this desired outcome, but be good with whatever happens. Yeah. And so even when, you know, he threw, he talks about throwing the uh, interception on the one yard line with the, uh, you know, a minute to go in the Super Bowl. Yep. And, of course, devastating. And yet, the first thing he did was, you know, the next day, just went back to practice. And to you, this neutral non-judgment is, uh, I find it, uh, in a culture that compares itself, in a culture who are, where our media is hoarding attention, necessarily come isn't always meritorious right and yet we're using that as a lens through which we see ourselves and see others beautiful how do you how do you manage to be kind to yourself how do you manage to resist judgment especially self-judgment uh, um 
huge points you're making there, especially around the merit and and where attention is going and and what can yield that attention and what can influence it. Um, you know, judgment is it's it's a it's really a negative piece of energy, just in and of itself. Just the idea of judging yourself or the idea of judging someone else is negative energy. So if you're in a place where you're trying to do great work and you're trying to be the best at what you can, the best that you want to be at what you're doing, you understand that you're not perfect. And if you can get to the point of not trying to pursue perfection, but pursuing the process in the present, you start to remove the shackles of judgment on yourself. It's difficult, but this is why I also say little things like the three wins remind you of, of your small successes so that you don't get into the trap of judging yourself in a negative way. As it relates to comparing yourself to others, we touched on that a little bit with that social comparison theory, so I'd like people to go and review that and research that and read up on that uh, because it is a natural thing for us to do. It's okay to look at someone. It's not okay to judge someone. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, hey, look, if if someone starts, if a crowd of people start running, <laughs> it's okay for you to kind of judge that situation and be like, oh, that doesn't look like it's safe. Let's start running. But uh, to to look at, you know, judging a book by its cover is not okay. Uh, and that's what we're also finding in this awakening. Uh, right now through this time that too, for too long people have been judging the book by its cover and haven't been spending enough time wanting to explore beyond judgment. Even if it's just superficial, even if it was non-intentional judgment on someone, it's just a bias that's now been conditioned um, and a prejudice that maybe can evolve from that uh, without you even knowing. So I think this whole idea of, of judgment is difficult to deal with because how we talk to ourselves is the most important thing that we can work on. And look, I'm going to be straight up. Like, I still struggle, not nowhere near where I was before, but I still struggle with negative thoughts. Like, I have a blog, I had an article that I wrote one time, and I was like, Emmy in one hand, negative thoughts in the other. Like, Dude, what? Like, how could you have any negative thoughts? <laughs> like, so it's a very natural human condition to go through this and that disbelief that can seep in. Here's the difference. The minute you become more present, the minute your awareness heightens. When your awareness heightens, your radar is up. When your radar is up, you can catch these things happening to you sooner, which allows you an opportunity to make a decision. Do you want to continue to feed that thought or are you recognizing it and it's time for what we call a pattern interrupt, something that jolts that moment and stops it from happening and, and you do something extreme or you do something that just gets you out of that particular environment in that particular mode of energy to do something different. Give us, and so, give us a, a concrete example. I mean, for me, man, uh, a concrete example is li like, um, so so a concrete example of like a pattern interrupt, yep. like what I've done. Okay, so one that I'll do is I get to work from home a lot, um, and, except for when we're traveling or we're doing productions and things of that nature. So for me, this might not work for everybody, but my ultimate reboot is that I will actually take off my clothes and retake a shower. Like that is the ultimate pattern interrupt. Now that is my extreme version. Before that, I've I've caught it, I've caught it, and I I've been paying attention to the triggers. What are the triggers that get me there, right? So I've been paying attention to those triggers. So now I caught it, and so I'll, I'll say, all right, it's time for a motivational playlist. Let me play some music right now to get me out of this state. Or I'll say, you know what? I'm taking a break. I'm gonna go watch 10 minutes of my favorite comedian on YouTube right now. I don't care what the deadlines are. I don't care what's going on. I'm in such a negative mood. I'm in such a bad energy. I'm gonna go watch 10 minutes of my favorite comedian. So th these are small ways that I deal with breaking the routine is all you're trying to do. Break that moment is all you're trying to do. So that moment can be that you're having brain lock on a creative idea. That moment could be that you're having disbelief 
in something that you're trying to do. That moment could be frustration that you're going through because maybe something isn't happening the way you want it to at that time and you're starting to feel really negative about it. The point is get yourself to a pattern interrupt and you can jolt that energy and stop it from taking you deeper into that hole. So practical, but so, so true, especially with creative blocks. Um, like the, the energy, I like the connection between energy and, and what you're really interrupting is a negative thought or a pattern or, or, or ultimately what it boils down to energy. And people are like, well, oh, I don't know the energy. Like, hey, quantum mechanics is pretty clear that all these things, intentions and that stuff matters. Energy matters. The quantum field actually creates the outcomes it's not the outcomes that affect you know or, or another way of saying it is the quantum field your energy creates results it's not that the results create the energy yes, man. oh so, god yeah. people rewind and <laughs> rewind that moment like that line right there that woo uh chase said quantum mechanics <laughs> <laughs> no, no man look, look dude no seriously you want some realness i was just look i i had uh I'll try to make this a really short story because this is really like to your point. Um, I, I suffer from a thing called gout and gout is something that is in my DNA. It's not because I have a bad diet or I'm obese or I drink heavily. It's got a combination of different types of foods that when they hit my, my, my body, it does a certain thing to the uric acid levels in my body and then it creates pain in my foot that is uh, like you can't put a bed sheet sometimes the, on, on the foot because it hurts that bad to even feel a bed sheet on it. So long story short, I was recently to, I was recently put on some medication because I had a flare up. The, the medication they put me on, they put me on it too long. That medication turns out after doing research, spiked my blood sugar levels up to a point where depending on which doctor you ask, I could have either been in a coma or should have had a heart attack because my levels are so damn high. This just happened three weeks ago. My doctor calls me and says, get in here right away. We need to put you on insulin. You're diabetic. And I'm like, no, I'm not. What are you talking about? So I get in there. They show me the chart. We see my levels. I'm like, holy crap. Yeah, I was having a, a thirst of the mouth. I was see, starting to see double and just thought my eyesight was just going crazy. I, you know, All this stuff that affects your eyes and temporary blindness and all this stuff. And I just coughed it up to the fact that I was dealing with this gout, gout flare up, right? I'm drinking 120 ounces of water a day and I'm still thirsty as hell. I'm going to the bathroom like crazy, way more than normal. So all these things are like uh, abnormal. So I go in, she tells me, we're gonna put you on this medication and you're gonna need insulin to get these levels down really quick to get you safe. I take insulin for like four days. During those four days, my wife and I came up with a mantra. So this gets to the energy part. My wife and I came up with a mantra and said, number one, we're not accepting the fact that this, I'm diabetic because we did the research that showed that the medication that I was put on before this induced me into that state by shutting down pancreas and some other stuff in my body. So we felt that we could reverse the effects. Well, how the hell am I gonna do that if I'm not gonna be on meds? I have to have the power of intention, I have to have the power of energy, and I have to have the power of belief that this is something that I can actually overcome and do. And then I have to have a plan and really think through the execution on this. All right, let's get the acupuncturist, check. All right, homeopathic doctor, let's get that check. All right, I'm, get, I'm gonna have July 4th is my date. I will be independent of insulin by July 4th. And I'm here to say, I came up with a mantra and I said, I am strong, I am resilient, I am healthy. I repeated that thing three, four times a day. And I'm here to say, before July 4th, bro, I took insulin for four days, haven't touched it in three weeks. I haven't touched a, med a piece of medicine in three weeks. I'm in all natural, all just adjusted my diet, realized that my carbs were higher than they should have been, did that, did a couple other things with exercise, and my levels are down to normal. So this, this isn't the outcome <laughs> that was supposed to happen this way. This is because the energy and the intention and what you're talking about, that quantum mechanics, me believing that I can do this. Now, if I couldn't do it, I was willing to accept it. But I know that energy is real. If I put it out there, I'm going to give it a shot and try. So I know that's a bit of a longer story to prove that point. But oh, this I just happened, dude. I am literally still taking my blood sugar levels every day, three times a day, just to check them. And I am amazed that I'm, you know, I'm at like right above the normal range every single day. Congrats, man. I know that like combination of intention and effort and energy. I think that's, that's the, that's the bee's knees right there. Um, 
Senator John Michelle Biden. Yeah, brother, absolutely. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, well, my favorite favorite artist of all time right there. I think I referenced him a few times in my book. And uh, he played a big Dude, role. You dropped Maya Angelou in your book. You got you got some you got some classics in the book, brother. <laughs> uh, oh, he's, what I love about Basquiat, and this is the, the topic that I want to discuss right now, is just this concept of doing it your own way. Mm. And you know, part of what used to be written are these scripts that this is, if you want to be on the radio, here's how you have to do this and then do this. And if you're lucky and if you get to, you know, pull records for somebody or be a research assistant for somebody who's on the radio, then maybe you're going to get in the room. And what I've learned, and I, I literally learned it in part from Jean-Michel Basquiat, which for those of you who don't know, he was a famous artist in New York in the 70s and 80s and um, famously uh, sold his first postcards to Andy Warhol for $10, um, <laughs> who was someone who arguably, you know, quote, discovered him. But his art was so different than the art that was happening. It was largely graffiti, very nonlinear. And uh, he said that, you know, he took art from the streets or for the walls in the museums and heard of and right now so many people at home are watching the show sitting there and thinking I want to do this thing whatever this thing is this dream we have and yet they're trying to do it the same way that everybody else has done it you go it's, this is like full circle moment because you went back and you opened this with your sort of career arc your life arc and it was very, as you said, nonlinear. And so I'm wondering if you can vouch for this or give some advice to people who are trying to do everything the way that, that they read about in the magazines and the books and might be denying what could be the biggest and most important part is their true self. Help us understand that. It's so beautiful uh, how you put that. It's it's. First and foremost, I would say, people, please stand in your courage. Like, really stand. You know, when, when in your book, when you talk about that whisper of your intuition, really stand in that intuition. Like, learn to listen to yourself. You know, when you have your gut and some data that backs you up, that's like spot on. <laughs> like, do that thing. I would say that, um, you know, I think that people... I, I, you know, I, man, so many thoughts come come to my mind when when I think about this. I, I wonder if um, tr try me try me a little bit of a different way, like like like. Sure, I'm gonna I'm gonna restart you. So, if what about you did you lean into in order to create the success for yourself that you created? Thing that people said you were too much of this or not enough of that and you ignored it or you you could ignore it but you did it anyway like what do you think and again these are things that this is a really common pattern in the world's highest achievers and i've seen this in your work but i want i want to know what about you was the thing that you figured you could double down on and and to and, and now I know where I was also going with the other point of like, like that whole scripting. And so let me see if I can answer both of these things at the same time. Uh, the scripting part uh, is it's OK for you to look at models. It's OK for you to. And look, my my thoughts here, my advice here is not be all end all. Let's be clear about that. But how I approach it is that I look at models and I do study models. But what I'm really looking for and what I was really getting at is the courage for you to stand in your uniqueness. Like that's the thing that I think you should really be focusing on more than focusing on your competitor or focusing on looking at someone else and how they do it or what their model is. Have you really spent the time to really focus in on your uniqueness? And your uniqueness might be something that scares the hell out of you. Like, how is that going to be something that could be for good? Yeah, you should try and hide that, right? Yes. We're scared of it. We're ashamed right. of it. 
That's yeah. right. We're embarrassed by it or we've been bullied over it or, you know, we've been penalized or been thought to be penalized for that thing. So what I would say is, and this is why I say it's, it's courage. What I would say is lean into the thing that you are most afraid to reveal as try to get to a level of comfort with that as best you can lean into that because that uniqueness is I think what my special sauce was. Mm -hmm. When you say, what did I double down on? I doubled down on what was unique about Mario. For some reason, Mario realized he had an ability to have natural energy that if he means well and wants people to do well, and if he could communicate that natural energy in a way that's focused and can give people um, systematic processes or, or, or steps of action that they can take and they can actually get results from that, that was where I realized, oh, I can do this differently than how an anchor or a reporter or another segment uh, expert delivers. Oh, I can, I can dress me. Like, don't try to conform to what we think we need to conform to because of the other models. And so I would show up on these sets. I remember my first time going on the Today Show. I was so green. It was deer in the headlights. I had a two-minute segment. And let me tell you, it, it was more like a minute 45, because let me tell you what they did to me. And it's not what they did to me. It's just how they probably work with new talent. They put you in a segment that's like five minutes long, but there's three different experts. And so they'll spend like a minute and a half with you, a minute and a half with another, and a minute and a half with another. And it can be under one big category, but each expert has a very specific niche that they're talking about. And so that it's their way of like, well, if this one fumbles, like the whole segment's not shot. <laughs> like they can still rebound. And when I was in that deer in the headlights and I went in and I just said, Mario, just be you, man. Like you've been working all this time. Just be you, be that fun, energetic, you know, maybe even some people call you over the top. Some people say you have too much energy. Some people say, you know, dial it down a little bit. Some people say, why don't you calm it down? Or, you know, why don't you put on the suit and tie? And I was like, no, I'm gonna wear a blazer and t-shirts and jeans and sneakers. Cause that's who I am. You know, I'm gonna wear these glasses and I'm gonna switch colors and that's who I'm going to be. So when I was able to lean into those things, uh, it really showed me right after that segment hit literally Three producers come at come at me. What else can you talk about? What else can you do? What other stuff besides tech can you do? It, it, it was just it's unbelievable. Like, oh sh shit! Like, oh, I cracked something. Yeah. And all I was was really trusting myself to be me and leaning on those things that other people thought I should change about me or conform about me or go to a more prescriptive process uh, about what I was going to do with my delivery. Yeah, the world wants you to be average, right? Because that's the, yes. world, the world's job is to <laughs> put you in line because it's easier. It knows how to handle you and manage you. And it's so true, it's Chase. Cool or a job or you, your boss wants you to be not too much like this, but a little less like that. Right. And, and you know, what I heard, from, well, I think you said it. If you didn't say it, I'm ascribing it to what you said is that you learn to trust yourself in that moment. Yeah, and I did. And for those I, folks, again, uh, we got uh, chats and comments coming in from all, all over the place. It's so fun to see see the world interacting with. See what's going on right now. <laughs> um, Lauren, thank you for being. I, you, you're you're in the in the in the mix there, Lauren Joyce. Thank you so much for being so present. Uh, Susan says your energy is what kicks it. Thank you, Mila. Um, Mario, Lauren, again in the house. Anyway, folks are are um, echoing your sentiment about being yourself. All right. I understand you got a metal lunchbox collection. What's that? <laughs> you know, we, we all have hobbies and interests, man. And one of the things that I think is really important is for us to find fun and to find uh, ways for you to do things. Like I have a sneaker closet, so some people like, are, my addiction is sneakers. I just love shoes and I wear them all. They're not sitting in boxes, they're like there. And, and on the walls, I have like my own handwriting of quotes and inspirational sayings and things like that in that same space is where this lunchbox collection is. And it's got everything in there from, you know, the A-Team 
to uh, a Scooby Doo lunch boxes, uh, and I'm talking about you know the metal lunch box with the thermos in that joint. I'm not oh, talking yeah. about those plastic ones, you know, Transformers. Um, you know, quite a few, quite a few, quite a few good ones in there, man. It's good, some good classics, and it's just you know, one of the things that I had to learn about myself is that, yo, I love to be, I love to act young. I love, not act young, I love to just be like young, youthful energy. Like I love to play, I love to have fun. I, I, I just, and I normally get like dissed. Like, yo man, you know, why don't you grow up? Like, you know, why are you still acting like that? And all, you know, it's like little subliminal, little subconscious things and things that people can say to you that they may mean well, but it's like these little microaggressions, the same way some of you may be like in your household having a dream and people are telling you, yeah, that's great, but I don't really see how you're gonna make that happen because you weren't doing that before. You didn't have that money. You didn't have those skills. You didn't graduate with that type of degree. Like all these things that, yeah, those are true, but that doesn't mean I can't still do this thing. And so I think like you know, having fun is a part of who I am and that's what that metal lunchbox collection is all about. And taking that fun and incorporating it into your work and life process is so important to round out who you are. I have found more opportunities and I have found some light bulb moments when I have stepped away to just have fun um, as opposed to really trying to kind of like solve this Rubik's Cube in that particular moment. So yeah, man, I love fun. I love my metal lunchbox collection. I love my I love my sneakers, <laughs> and uh, and I and I love changing eyewear. <laughs> Lauren from Facebook says it's called joy, right? Bringing joy, joy, yeah. joy to things that we do. <laughs> man, because it's already so damn hard, Chase. Like you already know this, man. Like anybody that's out there with a dream and an idea right now, look. Chase already salutes you. Mario already salutes you. We already know that for you to even have an idea and to take a single step towards it is a big deal. Like it's a big deal. And we just wanna see you continue to just do that and have enjoy in the process. That's one of the hardest things that my wife and I just talked about in the backyard three days ago when we were having this pre-meeting before the team, the company meeting. And one of the things that we said is we, constantly are trying to elevate ourselves and we did better last year. Here's what we did well. So how can we get even better at that? And part of that was let's figure out how we can have more fun in the journey. We were so destination oriented that it can burn you out when you don't reach the destination the way you would like to. This is why I say remove attachments and all these other things and be more mindful about it. But when you can have more joy in the process, so we now have like, like, written around the house in different in different spots like it's just the word fun like fun i have an alarm on my phone three times that goes off not that one but three times it goes <laughs> off and it says have fun today like i literally have to remind myself like how stupid is that like i have to remind myself three times a day to have fun today because man when you're ambitious people ambitious people need boundaries <laughs> when you see something for yourself and you really believe in it and it's not happening on the timeline that you think it should be happening on it gets really heavy to you and so how you can find joy in that process the three wins is a part of finding joy having that metal lunchbox collection and having a hobby and a thing that you can do outside of the thing that you're trying to pursue like all of these things together with that clarity and with that mindfulness, all those things together help me be more present and more fun in the journey. You heard what I said earlier when I was like, yo, I'm so, do we really have to call people now and try to get distribution for our show? Like this is a, this is a really well-produced show. We shoot it in NASDAQ studios in Times Square. It's multi-camera. It's, it's, it's really great quality production. And we're fighting to try to find a place to get a home for it that's got eyeballs that would also appreciate the same type of content. And that was a real negative energy. And so I said, fun. I said, you know what? What really bothers me is the fact that I have to do the research to go find all the names and the sites and the streaming places and the different websites that maybe a could be a distribution play for me. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to farm that part out. I'm gonna hire someone that can do that research for me because really what I want is I just want the names and the email addresses and the phone numbers. 
and then let me go to town. I'll do the selling. I'll do the pitching. I got the, the pitch materials. I can do, I get excited again. So now I'm, I'm in that fun mode. So find those things that are disrupting your fun and making it feel more like a chore. Try your best to outsource those things or barter somebody value for value for those things so that you can actually try to do more of the things that are really fun for you to do uh, on your journey. Yeah, and to your earlier point about uh, like if you're getting shit from someone, the chances are they're further they're they're not further along in their journey because most of the people that I know who are so so far along in their entrepreneurial or creator journey or their life journey, those aren't the ones that are talking trash. Yeah, right? you're, you're never gonna find someone talking trash who's done more than you. It's always someone <laughs> less and less. And it's, you know, this combination that you just shared about mindfulness and fun and clarity. And it's sort of like recapping the, the arc of our conversation right now. And I think the fact that it there's an, an emphasis on fun and that it's okay to outsource the things that you're not great at. Like, it, you know, it seems like you've just articulated a recipe if I'm bounds here, but is there anything else that's missing from that recipe? If it is a recipe? Yeah, I like the way you put that. It does feel like a recipe. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been saying a lot about uh, your, your book throughout, you know, it's right here, right? Throughout this uh, conversation quite a bit that because I feel like that too has been a recipe. I don't think there's anything uh, missing. Um, from that recipe, <laughs> I think I think the only thing I would say is um, if there's one other thing that people would take away from that recipe, I would say getting a support system around you is one of the most important. I, I can't stress how important it is for you to take care of your mental and your physical health and to have a support system around you that supports what it is you're trying to do. And if you have been struggling to get support from people that you love. I'm not talking about support from people that you don't love. There's a very big difference in what I'm saying because we're addicted to, to, to acceptance and we're addicted to validation from others. What I'm talking about is the people that you actually do care about and you actually do love. And it would really be nice if they really supported you in your journey, right? What I would say is to those people that may be suffering from some of that, try to pitch them differently. Instead of saying what it is you're gonna do, do a little thing I tried. I made everything into a slide deck. And I actually sat the family down and treated them like they were a meeting and they were a partner that I was trying to convince as to why you should believe in me. And I had slides that had the who, the what, the why, the when, the how. Each slide, five slides, just covering it. Here's who I am, here's what I've achieved in the past, Here's what I'm trying. Here's what I'm trying to do. Here's how I'm going to do it. Here's when I would like to do it by. And here's what I'm going to need in order to try to get there. When you do that, you disarm so many of the other knee-jerk reactions. Let me. If your idea is that good, or if you're really that passionate, and you really believe in something you want to do, you deserve to present it more than just talking to someone about the idea. They really need to see you present it to them so that they understand what you're fighting for. And then they can make a choice as to whether or not they're going to really support you. And then I would say this, I would say to them, do you love me? And hopefully they'll say yes. <laughs> you say, do you love me? And when they say yes, then you say, well then I don't need you to understand what it is I'm, what it is I'm doing and thinking and where, what I see for myself. I just need you to support me in trying to get there. What are they gonna say? Well, shit. I wish I would have known that was the answer because I would have said I don't love you. Like, what are they gonna say? <laughs> what are they gonna say? <laughs> no, like, so it. you know, yeah. it, and and not every you're not gonna get every person to get on board with that dream, and that's why it's important for you to find support elsewhere. So let me tell you, man. D, another quick tip for people, because I, I feel like we might be closing, so I just wanted to hit a couple quick tips. Hit people on the DM and Instagram. I'm telling you that still works. Have your pitch clear. Have your ask very succinct and very specific, and it works. I have been, I still DM people in, in, 
<laughs> on IG, okay? So you feel free to DM me. If you're hearing this conversation, you're like, Mario, that sounds great, but I really could use some deeper advice on maybe how would I create that? Or I'll even take a look at your presentation. I've done that before. I've taken a look at people's presentations. Like, ah, you should move that slide to the front and get in blah, blah, blah. So however I can help your audience, Chase, um, I'm down to do. So DM me on Instagram at Mario Armstrong or, or reach me via email, MarioArmstrong at gmail.com and, and I'll get back to you within 48 hours. East New York ENT says, Mario, you've got a new fan. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. And it's not a new fan, man. It's just extending the family reach. I call them cousins. New okay. people that come into the family, you're now, you're now a cousin. So don't be surprised if I say, hey, I'm in your neck of the woods. Let's go grab a bite to eat and sit at the table. Um, it's, uh, so, it's so been grateful. Amazing. So grateful for your time, man. And again, if, uh, if the people want to pay attention to you, you just gave your Instagram handle, at Mario Armstrong on IG. To steer them maybe to, uh, to your new show or what? Thank you for that. Uh, the YouTube channel would be great. So go to youtube.com um, slash never settle show, or just do a search for never settle show on YouTube. Start watching the episodes. They're right there. They're only 19, 20 minutes, great little power packed episodes. And then we have a ton of other uh, behind the scenes and Q and A content. So there should be some things there that can help you. Our podcast is called wake up and level up. You can go to wakeupandlevelup.com if you want to grab that. But really, I want to get more people to go to that YouTube channel because that's where we're investing a lot of time and energy and as well as Instagram. Um, but reach out to me. We have worksheets that are free uh, on our website. If you go to neversettle.tv, you'll see that there are tons of worksheets. So if you're trying to figure out your passion and you need that help getting that clarity, we have a worksheet that will just give us your email address and then we can send it to you. Uh, but we got worksheets and other homework that we have up on our site that's ready to help you. Um, if you want to build your S curve and we explain what an S curve is and how you can use that to help you maneuver in your life and what you may need to acquire to get to a higher level of your S curve. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that's on there. Uh, the fear ladder is on there as well. So never settle TV and, and the YouTube channel never settle show. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, I'll give a shout out to our man, Damon and Damon John from Shark Tank for introducing yes. us. Um, Thanks to uh, Jamel, Dr. Vibe, uh, Gwen, Lauren, uh, Tim, Eduardo. We got a big shout out from the uh, Creative Live Worldwide Creator Community. I want to say thanks again for being on the show, my man. Good luck with your show. Speaking of shows, I'm a fan and I appreciate you coming on today and sharing your wisdom and knowledge. Uh, we've, we've got work to do. Brother. And you're doing it. And that's the thing, man. Like, you know, Gary you talked about it a lot, right? Like, just document, right? Like, document by creating, document by doing. Uh, it's not talking about what you're going to do. It's actually doing what you're going to do. So thank you, man, for um, allowing me to come on to your platform and really respect your audience and, and feel the love and the warmth from your audience. And, and thank you for what you're doing to bring other voices that haven't had an opportunity to, be, to, to meet you. We have not yet met in person. I can't wait for that moment. It's I'm happening. Gonna, I'm, I'm going to look for ways to force that to happen. Believe you me, buddy. We're gonna, I'm finding ways in my mind to force that to happen. Um, and I can't wait to meet the wife, too, because it sounds like I, you know, I'm going to start following her online and, and learning from her. Um, but man, your actions have always matched your ambitions, man. So thank you for being you and, and, and showing us a light and, and a way that we can go about having integrity and pursuing our dreams while also having morals about that approach. So, uh, yeah, man, this has been fantastic. This has been one of, I, you know, I'm right now, dude, like I'm so pumped for this, man. It's like one of the best, like you can tell I don't want to go, right? But I know we got to cut it. it off at some point, I man. <laughs> Listen, I, I already, I, I was going to apologize for going a little bit long, but uh, no, this is, it makes me feel better that you're, that you're good. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, no, man, no apologies necessary. We're in the present. This is the energy. Hopefully we helped a lot of people. And for those people that need more help, reach out to Chase and myself, man. That's what we're here about. That's what we're doing. So thanks again, my brother. And I look for ways that I can bring you into my audience and bring you into my world and uh, figure out how we can find some fun stuff to do together. We'll do it. We'll do it. And uh, I want to see your sneaker, your your kick collection and that lunchbox. <laughs> and... Uh, 
I'm looking forward to our, our next hang. Thank you, Vanessa and Julie and uh, Timmy, Timmy122. Um, I just appreciate the worldwide communities giving you a shout out. And if uh, you're just tuning in a little bit late and uh, coming into the end of our live stream here, yes, you can listen to this. Uh, watch it on my YouTube channel, um, catch it on Creative Live or on my podcast, The Chase Jarvis Live Show, where we will do an audio only version shortly. All the platforms. My man, thanks again so much. We know where to pay attention to you, and you got a bunch of new fans and followers. Uh, to our next hang. And really appreciate it. Everybody keep pursuing their dreams. Let's make it happen. However, I can help, I'm here for you. Let's go, Chase. Let's go, Chase. Let's go. <laughs>